This is the second video about bifurcations. Let me just very briefly review the idea of a bifurcation by using the CD-ROM. The program that I'm going to be using here is called Phase Lines. And let's just pick a differential equation. The differential equation we have picked here. If you look over on the right, I'm not sure how well that will turn up for you. It looks to be dy dt equals uh, y times 1 minus y minus a. Here, a is the parameter. In the previous video, I called the parameter mu. You can call it anything you want as long as you don't give it the same name as the independent and dependent variables. Notice here that essentially we must have a certain value of a picked because we have a certain slope field with certain equilibrium solutions. In fact, it looks like this probably is A equals zero because these equilibrium solutions occur at Y equals zero and Y equals one. If I click on the lower left at phase line, I can bring a phase line up over on the left side. And by clicking either on the slope field or on the phase line, I can see what happens. If I click over there, you see both a solution curve that's increasing and the point on the phase line, it's getting the Y coordinate as time goes by. Let's pick a point with a value of Y bigger than one, say up close to two here. I'll try it on the phase line. Click. You see the uh, point went downwards toward the equilibrium point at one and you see the solution curve is decreasing. Just below zero, we can see the arrow is pointing downward. The solutions will decrease very rapidly. The point goes down the phase line. I can also click down here in the lower middle on an option that says bifurcation plane. And essentially what this is, is it's a bifurcation diagram, as I showed you in the last video. The, over on the right, the parameter A is on the horizontal axis. And the dependent variable Y is on the vertical axis. You can see a slider down below for the value of A. It's set at zero, but I can move the slider to the right to increase the value of A. Notice how the phase line moves to the right those equilibrium points move closer together and they merge at A equals 1 into one equilibrium point. Actually, it's A equals 0.25, where it occurs right there. And then when A is bigger than 0.25, there are no equilibria. You just see a downward pointing arrow on the phase line. Maybe zoom out a little bit if it's not zoomed out enough to see the slope field. At the same time, let me go back to the start. There was the start. A, we had two equilibrium solutions at y equals 0 and y equals 1. As A increases, those equilibrium solu solutions move closer together until they merge into 1 when A is 0.25. And then there are no equilibrium solutions when A is greater than 0.25. And all solution curves decrease like that. So you can see there are, it's not just a, a straight line decrease. It's it's concave up at first and then concave down because the slope field is still relevant. As far as the uh, phase line goes, the point goes fast at first, if I start up near two, then it slows down and then it speeds up again. Watch it. Here we go. One, two, three, goes fast, slow, fast again. As reflected in the graph being steep over here, then flatter, then steeper again. I want to take you over to the transparency now to do another example quickly by hand. This example is a bit more complicated than the example from the last video, or at least it's a little harder to, to interpret. I'm going to go ahead and use the letter A again as my parameter instead of mu. Once again, we've got a quadratic function. First thing to do is try to, try to find the equilibrium points. You're going to have to use the quadratic formula if you've got a parameter. 
So the equilibrium points are going to occur at negative B, which is uh, negative A, don't let that confuse you, plus or minus square root of B squared, which is A squared, minus 4AC, 4 times 1 times 1, over 2A, again, where I'm saying A, B, and C based on what you learned with the quadratic formula. But this definitely depends on A. A over, negative A over 2, plus or minus, let's write it as 1 half times square root of A squared minus 4. A much more complicated function of A, two, really two functions of A. Negative A over 2 plus 1 half square root of A squared minus 4, and negative A over 2 minus 1 half square root of A squared minus 4. This term is irrelevant as far as deciding whether or there are real solutions here. It still is the term underneath the square root that determines that there, whether there are going to be real solutions. You're going to have two equilibria if and only if a squared minus 4 is bigger than 0. which is equivalent to saying a squared itself is bigger than 4. And be careful, that means a itself is either bigger than 2 or less than negative 2. You might write that as the absolute value of a needs to be bigger than 2. But that means that either a is less than negative 2 or a is greater than 2. In those two cases, you're going to have two equilibrium. There are really two places where a bifurcation occurs, two bifurcation points. A equals minus 2 and A equals plus 2. You're going to have zero equilibria when A squared minus 4 is less than 0, which is equivalent to saying that A is between negative 2 and positive 2. You'll have one equilibria, equilibrium when a equals negative 2 or a is positive 2. Those two values of the parameter correspond to bifurcation points. They're, they're called bifurcation points. They're places where bifurcations, these big changes, occur. What about a bifurcation diagram? Better be more careful here. In fact, I think I better be careful enough to use the computer. I'm going to go on the computer now, onto Mathematica, and I'm going to graph um, essentially these two functions of A. Y is a function of A. Let's go back to the computer. And I. Uh, from the uh, two videos ago, from section 1.6 video, I found a nice command to make my plot thicker since the plot in the video about section 1.6 on phase lines didn't turn out so well. We will use that here. I'm going to plot these two functions of A. Negative A over 2 plus 1 half times the square root. You can type that in as capital S then QRT, or you can use the basic input palette, A squared minus 4. That's one function of A that I want to plot. Then another function of A is negative A over 2 minus 1 half times the square root of A squared minus 4. If you haven't figured it out yet, um, copy and paste is very useful in helping you save time, not only in Microsoft Word, but also in Mathematica. My bifurcation values were negative 2 and plus 2, so I want to make sure that I include those two values. Let's, well, let Mathematica pick a plot range, but I'm going to make this plot thicker by doing plot style capital P, capital S, then arrow thick with a capital T. There we go. There's the 
there's my bifurcation diagram. Except, um, at least as far as the, uh, the curves of equilibrium points. I haven't labeled the axes here. If you were doing this on the, an assignment you were to hand in, you would want to label the axes. I won't take the time to do that. The command is axis label, axes label, capital A, capital L. And you can look that up. What should I do now if I'm going to make a bifurcation diagram, a full bifurcation di diagram? I want to make a bunch of phase lines. Vertical lines that are phase lines, they're y-axis in a sense, for different values of A. Let me go back and do that up on the overhead projector. I'll just try to roughly sketch these curves in. One curve looks about like this. One curve about like this. This is A is plus 2, this is A is minus 2. Uh, in between, you've got no equilibria. What about upward or downward pointing arrows? Well, you go back up to the top. Think about what the graph of the right-hand side looks like. If A is 0, it's the graph of Y squared plus 1, which looks like that as a function of Y on the horizontal axis now. It's always positive. So going back down to the bifurcation diagram, you want upward pointing arrows. Turns out that if you make graphs of the right-hand side for negative 2 and plus 2, you've got these two equilibrium, well, they each have one equilibrium point. You'll get positive values of the right-hand side elsewhere, and so you'll get upward pointing arrows. And then if you pick a value of A, say at 4, and negative 4. In each of those cases, you're going to have two equilibrium points. Let's go to A equals 4 right here. You're going to have upward pointing arrow when Y is above this equilibrium point, and upward pointing arrow when you're down, way down here, barely off my transparency there, when you're below that equilibrium point, and a downward pointing arrow because the graph on the right hand side will be negative for these values of y in between the two equilibrium points. And a similar kind of thing is going to happen over here. Upward pointing arrow, upward down here, and then in between you've got downward pointing arrows. So if we imagine this as a movie, thinking of A as time, I start off at a negative value of A, less than negative 2, I've got two equilibria. As A increases, those equilibria move together. They merge when A is negative 2. Then you don't have any equilibria until all of a sudden another bifurcation occurs at positive 2. You get one equilibria and then two. Once more, back to Mathematica. I want to illustrate this what happened here, this phenomenon, in a different way. Using Mathematica version 6, 6 is dynamic interactivity. We're going to make a little movie, an animation, showing, in this case, how the graph of the right-hand side of the differential equation changes as A changes. And the key command that we need to use is called manipulate. As usual, the first letter capitalized, manipulate. Manipulate is going to make our animation as the parameter A varies. What am I going to animate? I'm going to animate a bunch of plots. So I'm going to put the plot command inside the manipulate command. We're working from inside out. What am I going to plot? I'm going to plot the right-hand sides. They were y squared plus a times y. Don't forget to put that time symbol in there. Plot that function of y. Oh, let's go from negative 5 to 5. It's probably a good idea to keep our plot range, the vertical range on the axes constant here so it doesn't jiggle around too much with this animation. 
I'm going to make it thick again with plot style, thick. So there I have my, I've closed off my plot command, but now I need to close off the manipulate command, put a comma, and then tell Mathematica to let A vary by making a list with A as the first element. The, uh, lowest value of A as the second element and the uh, highest value of A as the third element. My bifurcations occurred at negative two and plus two, so I want to make sure I include those values. I'll go negative four to four again like I did for the previous plot. So it's two commands here, plot and manipulate are the main commands that are merged. So in a sense, this what's going to happen is, is you, the plot command is going to get uh, done a lot here for many different values of A. That's what's going to happen here. If I enter this, I see a little window with a plot for a certain value of A. You can see the A here in the slider, which I can slide. And let's watch how it affects the graph. As A increases, note when A is negative, less than negative 2, I've got two Y intercepts, two horizontal axis intercepts that correspond to the two equilibrium points at my phase line. A increases, you can see the graph going up, though it's not, not a uh, straight vertical translation. When A is negative 2, which is right about there, we've just got one intercept one equilibrium point for the phase line. As A increases further, we go further up and we've got no equilibria. How is, how's it going to come back down? When A is up to plus two, we've got to have another bifurcation occur. Watch this, as A goes past zero, all of a sudden the graph starts to come down now. And there's our second bifurcation at A equals plus 2. And once we're past plus 2, now we've got two equilibrium points. I can watch this as a movie by clicking on the plus sign to the right of the slider and pressing play. And we can watch our little movie here. You can see the value of A up in this little window right here, changing. To see this movie. So that gives a little bit more insight as to why this kind of bifurcation can occur, that this phenomenon of seeing two bifurcations occur with, even though we only have one parameter. To understand why the graph is doing this, it's important to think about what this function is and what role A plays. The function here is y squared plus a times y plus 1, a is going to be the slope of the function at y equals 0. So certainly when a is negative, you're going to have a negative slope. And when a is positive at y equals 0, you'll have a positive slope. The 1 is constant. You always have a vertical intercept at 1. Notice that's what stays constant in all these pictures. This vertical intercept is always at the point 0 comma 1. But the slope of the graph through that point changes from negative to 0 at one instant and then to positive values for larger values of x. So that's a real neat way to help you understand what's going on. Finish off this video by showing you another neat thing that comes up in studying bifurcations. Although this time it's not a bifurcation for differential equations, it's bifurcations for something called a map. Um, when the word map is used in math, it actually usually means the same thing as function. Okay? Although it's, it's not always thought of in the usual way that you might be used to. You think, when you use the word map for function, you're thinking geometrically. You're thinking about what the function does to certain points in a geometric sense. What I have here, if you want to zoom in close to that pretty picture, is a picture of something called a Julia set. 
for a, a filled Julia set. And I don't really want to get into the details of how this picture is made. You'll notice there's a couple other things in this picture. There's a, a function down here, a function of z. z is actually representing a complex number variable. And you'll see there's an i there, which represents the square root of negative 1. And you also see a little plane here. This is actually representing something called the complex plane. The horizontal axis is called the real axis. The vertical axis is called the imaginary axis. Not that the uh, axis is a figment of your imagination. It really is there. But it's just a way to represent complex numbers. And the, uh, the plus sign there is on a particular complex number, which, we are, which is actually this number right over here, which in this scenario we we're thinking of as being a parameter, really. It's a, it's a complex number parameter, as strange as that sounds, that it really is the reality here. And as we change this parameter, bifurcations, if you will, can occur big changes in this picture can occur for slight changes in the parameter. Now, usually when you make a slight change in a parameter, actually, the usual case is not that not much changes. Let's see if I can change this in a slight enough way that not much changes. Um, Here we go. I guess it. Well, I think I just redid the same one. If you change it just a little bit, usually not much changes. But if you, but sometimes big changes can occur. Oh, there a change occurred, but that was a big change. I guess I moved it further than I wanted to. We get a, bit, a picture of a different kind of Julia sets. And we can continue moving this parameter to different places in this complex plane and get different kinds of Julia sets. That one that's coming up right now is not quite as interesting. Actually, there's a nice way to pick the parameter value. There's a, another set called the Mandelbrot set, which is not a Julia set, but it does have a similar kind of feel to it in that it's got a lot of very intricate things that you can find out about it. It's a very interesting kind of picture. If we pick values for the parameter inside this black region here, we can get different kinds of Julia sets. For example, if I pick one up here, I'll get uh, a certain kind of Julia set over on the right. If I pick another value of the parameter, still in the same black region of the Mandelbrot set, not too far away, I'll get a Julia set that's not too much different. Just a little skinnier, it looks like. But if I go to another black blob in the Mandelbrot set over here on the left, for example, if I go over into this little tiny one over here, I do get a different looking Julia set. A bifurcation has occurred. I would encourage you to actually look up Mandelbrot sets and Julia sets on the internet and see if you can find little applets that do something like this. You'll, you should have fun if you uh, explore uh, these sets. They have a lot of uh, intricate things that go on with them. And I'll leave that up to you.